This is Lauren Anderson, contributor to Great Black Speakers, and today I'm interviewing the great Boyd, the Rainmaker, Melson. So, Boyd, welcome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate Absolutely. being here. Absolutely. So, Boyd, you are a boxer, philanthropist, and a veteran. Yes, ma'am. All three. You wow. hit it. That's amazing. So, tell us a little bit about who you are, your backstory. My name is Boyd Nelson, as you know. I went to West Point for college. I am majored in psychology and that military at West Point at least, if you don't have an engineering major, you have to have an engineering minor. I minored in nuclear engineering. It sounds a lot more complicated than it is. <laughs> Just a lot of variables you solve for, no calculus involved. Then I started, I started boxing while I was at West Point and I took it as a gym course, mandatory. All male freshmen have to take it as a mandatory gym course. I took it and I found out I had a, something I excelled in. And I signed up for basketball for intramurals. And at West Point, about 80% of the cadet base played the, uh, varsity letter sports. The chief varsity letter to play sports in high school. So even though they, they didn't qualify for a D1 scholarship, or no scholarship for West Point, but they're not playing a D1 sport or club sport, it's very competitive in intramurals. Very, very competitive. Everyone wants to show they still got it. So I signed up for basketball. I was forced to box. I didn't want to box. And we ended up winning the school championship. My wow, wow. my freshman year, I kept knocking people out, and then we uh, went on to fight in the. I signed up for a tournament in the school that's offered, and I signed up with the captain of the boxing team. Who was in my weight class. I never boxed before I knocked him out, and then I joined the school team the next year, intercollegiate. I won the national title, and then I kept going. Then when I had to serve my five years back in the army, I found out the army has a program named the World Class Athlete Program for the Army's Olympic hopefuls, and that's your job year round. I did that. I was an alternate for the 08 Olympic team. I was on Team USA for three and a half years. I earned my MBA at the same time while I was doing that. And during that whole process, even before I graduated, I met a young woman who was paralyzed. Uh, she broke her neck when she was 10 years old. We became romantic shortly after, and her dream to walk again became my dream. So I intertwined my boxing with sharing her message of inspiration. And then when I left boxing and I fell short of making the Olympic team, I thought that my boxing days were done. I went on to corporate America, had some challenges fitting in. I didn't understand the corporate talk where if somebody says, you know, you're doing everything great, but if I can make one suggestion, it'd be this, but you're doing everything great. That means you're doing nothing wrong. You need to make that need to make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that's what that meant. So I had a tough time, but then I also found out about a clinical trial that a Dr. Wise Young, who was one of Christopher Reeves, Superman's uh, advisors when Christopher Reeve had broke his neck. He was trying to bring a clinical trial to the U.S. for many years at that time. And it was taking umbilical cord stem cells, so families who donate their baby's umbilical cord blood or bank it themselves after their babies are born. They take the adult stem cells that are in there, and he has wanted to bring a trial to the U.S. where he's going to be injecting them into the spinal cord. And he did this study in China already. He managed it just like it was an American clinical trial. And 15 out of the 20 patients now with a walker, paralyzed average of seven years. One of them was paralyzed 14 years before he had the procedure. One of them was 59 years old before he had the procedure. Three of them neck down are now walking 15 out of the 20 wow. with a walker. Not like you and me with our gait, but getting from A to B. Mm -hmm. At least 10 meters, up to over 100 meters, some of them, and half of them got their bladder and bowel back. So two parts, it's getting FDA approval here in the US and raising the funds. Mm -hmm. It's gonna cost around $150,000, funds provided by the research team per patient, they want to do 12 patients, and the government nor private uh, corporate America have come in to yeah. help try to yeah. fund this. That's amazing, Boyd. So that's, you know, a pretty comprehensive, um, you know, background that you just gave us in regard to your family and you, first of all, on behalf of all of us, thank you all for your service and especially for what you're doing now. You know, I've been reading about you and, and, and what you've done and your accolades and I really have to say that you are an outstanding individual. Um, so I want you to explain to us more about what it is that you do. Um, you're a boxer. You're a veteran. You're a philanthropist. And I want to know, um, you know, what is it that you're doing? few different parts, different aspects of my life. I worked in medical device sales for a good amount of years as my nine to five, where you're the subject matter expert in the operating room selling a product that physicians are using intraoperatively. So you have to be an expert on the device. It can be an implant. It can be some type of piece of equipment they're using that doesn't get implanted. You also have to know your stuff very well, the, med the medical terminology, the procedure. You have to speak peer-to-peer -to, -peer to these surgeons 
to gain their respect. So that was one of the things I did. I'm no longer doing that, but I worked for Johnson & Johnson for three years. I worked for Medtronic for half a year, and I worked for a startup company named Gal Surgical for a year. So that, uh, I teach fitness classes out of this big chain named Equinox throughout Manhattan. Mostly boxing I teach, but the boot camps and cardio sculpt and all these funky names they have. I go around and I speak often. When I go to elementary, high school, or junior high schools, I, I've yet to charge. I go around and I volunteer my time. I speak kindergarten through, actually I go to colleges as well, so kindergarten through co co college, every level I've spoken. And I do that happily. And the message, I think, because at kindergarten, there's only so much they're going to take from you. So the message of being kind and judging somebody by their kindness is the takeaway I give them. It doesn't matter what they look like, what they smell like, that's all they are, being kind. Yeah. I box professionally. I donate every penny I earn. I've done this my entire career. To I've had 17 pro fights. 16 of the fights I've donated to this clinical trial I just mentioned. One of the fights, my childhood friend's son was battling cancer, a glioblastoma, and I they, need, they were raising funds to help cover the medical bill, so I, I gave my purse to him. So that was one of them. So I always let people know because there's one fight I didn't give towards that. And I'm in the Army Reserve. I'm a captain in the Army Reserve. That's one week in a month, two weeks a year, and sometimes stuff during the week I have to go on in. We have Team Fight to Walk. I'm a co-founder with Kristen Zaccanino. She was once my girlfriend. She's paralyzed. She's been paralyzed now for, what year, 93? This was July 7th. will make 23 years. Mm -hmm. Sometime. And... I also get paid to speak professionally. I go I'm invited to Gallus. I get I just read most recent speech. I went and fired up the I the Johns Hopkins women's basketball team in their locker room before they went on out. So it's a myriad out of a myriad of a lot of it. Yeah, you got a lot going on. Um, so I want to know more about your boxing. So I am fascinated by boxing. I'm a boxing fan. And I mean, you have a list of accolades that are very extensive, including, you know, three time gold medalist in the Army, world military champion, boxer, um, you know, captain in the US military, amazing accomplishments. Um, tell me, what is your most favored award from, from all of the things that you do? It's probably when I, the war, the, West Point Brigade Open champion when, when I knocked the captain of the boxing team out. It's a it's my freshman year. It's because I never boxed before. And he was so mean. And <laughs> the, hey, it was like the movie Annapolis with Tyrese on James Franco. That was my real life story. They oh, stole wow. the story. But I won. Argue, arguably, James, uh, James Franco won. That moment and how that was the catalyst, everything that's happened in my life regarding boxing and combining West Point and boxing, it, it, the path I've been on, the trajectory, trajectory is incredible. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's one of them. When I won the World Military Championship, I was the first American in 12 years to win a gold. Wow. I just beat a guy who came back from Greece fight, fighting in the Athens Olympics in 2004, and I beat him in the semis. He was from Morocco, and then I beat the under-19 world champion in the finals from Uzbekistan. I only had... Outside of these guys had had hundreds and hundreds of fights. I had 18 fights in college at the low level, and I had seven fights going into that outside of college. Most important, my coach didn't want me to compete in that tournament, even though I earned my spot because I thought I was—he thought I was going to get injured. He said, "This isn't the Olympic trials, boy. These are Olympians. You're going to get hurt." And I was at a military camp, military school in in Fort Sill, Lawton, Oklahoma, that whole summer going through field artillery training. The officer basic course for four and a half months, 100 to 110 degrees every day. All they had was a heavy bag. Just having a heavy bag to train is like banging your head against a wall every wow. day. And I told him, I earned the spot, coach. You're not taking this from me. I earned it. He said, "You're not." nobody comes back from military school in shape. I lost 17 pounds while I was in school. And not only did I show up and compete, I was the first American in 12 years. And then to win a gold medal, awesome. and I, that's around my chest. And I walked into the gym, and I was oh, he never <laughs> bet against me, coach. Never. <laughs> and then I have to say the last one is this: this work, the, the three-way tie, the world mil the I'm sorry, the WBC Junior Middleweight United States Championship that I just won. My first ten-round fight, I hadn't fought for 15 months. There were so many challenges in that camp, including I had Army Reserve duty for four days. Three days prior to weigh in, and I had to lose 17 pounds in three days to in get down. Three to weigh. days. 
Yep. Because How did I you do it? You just keep working out and you just don't drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> after. So I had it to lose because I had been dieting and dieting, but I had four days in a row. We had weapons qualification in May on the range, and I'm drinking, I'm drinking because I'm thirsty, and my body's retaining all the water. So put on the top and bottom plastics, worked training twice a day, and my legs were shot because I ran so much. I had to save my legs those last days. So wow. put Abilene all over, makes you sweat, mm -hmm. which just opens your pores. I had these layers on, then the plastics and the winter cap. And did you do the gum chewing too? Oh, did I? Girl, my gum got <laughs> back half of my tongue. I don't know. It looked like something in a night, night of the Living Dead. Oh it got God. so raw from doing it for three days straight. It all blistered and corroded. I couldn't taste things funny. And my the morning I woke up for my fight, my lymph nodes were all swollen here, here, eyes burning, skin sensitive to the touch like a fever. My legs were so, I was like, I can't believe I have to fight today. But I said, I'm going to show up when the moment comes. So you wear all the stuff. My drill, I was going in. 20, 25 minutes nonstop on the pads, a thousand punches on the bag, and then sitting, keeping the stuff on and spitting, spitting, spitting. Did that twice a day. Did that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I and went. Did that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning, and then I weighed in Wednesday afternoon, and it was it was one of the hardest experiences ever. And through it all, you won. And then I had the best fight. I had boxed as a professional. Wow. To the day. That's yeah. a great triumph. That's a great triumph. So tell me, who are your boxing inspirations in the sport? Muhammad Ali. Because of the character outside of the boxing ability. And regardless, I believe, of what your stance is on going to war or not, that somebody was willing to commit to a choice and suffer because they believed in it. And it wasn't a choice I was physically hurting somebody else. So that it was a choice that was righteous and certain man, it didn't cause anyone else to suffer. It just was extraordinary and he made people laugh. Mm -hmm. And he, he just had this aura, this light. You can see him, he was like Bruce Leroy from The Last Dragon, like you see his glow. <laughs> Muhammad Ali, Manny Pacquiao with all these people who are doing stuff outside of boxing for giving uh, back. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what what Floyd Mayweather has done to allow boxers to demand greater purses now. That aspect of him, you can never take that from him and every boxer alive should be thankful for him. And for Oscar De La Hoya to create a company that by be the first person, first boxer to create a big wig promotional company, also paved a new pathway the same way Floyd did with, with allowing boxers to earn more. Mayweather, I'm, I'm sorry, Oscar did with showing life after boxing and you can still be involved at a high level. Oscar, when I fought on one of his cards at the Barclays Center, I was the first fight in the history of the Barclays Center. He matched my purse. He watched my HBO Real Sports episode with his wife. And when I saw him that day of weigh-ins, he'd come and go, boy, 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 my main man, my main man, my wife loves you, she loves you. That's how he speaks real giddy. And I looked at him and said, you watched it, Oscar? Goes, yeah, I watched it. He said, I want to tell you what, if you ever fight on my, my cars, I'm going to match your purse. And he did it both times I fought on his cars. That's awesome. That's awesome. Those, those, are, those are great inspirations. I know, you know, people praise you for your character outside of the ring with all that you do for... Um, you know, the the spinal cord injury uh, research and, and what you've done for, you know, your girlfriend and how you're She's fighting. We well, haven't been together since 09. Your ex-girlfriend. Yeah, um, she has a boyfriend of two and a half years now. Okay. <laughs> and what you do, you know, with donating your purses to, to the research, which is, you know, outstanding. So what is the message that you want to tell the world regarding your goals? Service, selfless service to humanity is a goal that if every human being pledged to themselves as their primary goal, every human being would be surrounded by people pledging themselves to that person. You would never have to worry about you being the only one giving because everybody would always be willing to give to you at the same time. It's very, very important to understand that aspect. 
selfless service to humanity. Not all humans are human beings. You just have to be born to be a human. A human being, the being aspect, is the pledging yourself to humanity. You hold that vision of what that space looks like and you bleed until there's no more blood left in your body to defend that. And I promise you the universe will conspire. Wow. That's an amazing message. Tell me um, about Team Fight to Walk. Team Fight to Walk, set up by Kristen and this knucklehead right here. <laughs> And our mission is to create awareness despite the need to raise to conduct clinical trials in the United States to cure spinal cord injuries as well as clinical trials overall for challenges, sicknesses, syndromes, any of the above that are terminal. And right now Kristen and, and I are carrying all the weight, so we haven't been able to spread out larger than spinal cord injury. I started this idea when I told her I was going to, I asked her if I should box professionally. And my favorite book is The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. And in The Alchemist, it states by Paul Coelho, if you follow what's in your heart with divine love, the universe will conspire. And in turn, you will create your personal legend. So when I said to Kristen, Kristen, I just got hired by Johnson & Johnson but we need to raise funds. I believe that I can hold this space. And because of all my demographics, I draw attention, especially in a sport like boxing. And if I can just be successful, I can talk. And people will listen or at least hear me. But I believe they will listen if I lead by example and risk myself in that ring only to give towards what I'm asking them to give. And that's donate everything I earn. But I just got hired by Johnson. I was just hired by Johnson & Johnson. This is 2010. We're in a recession still. It took a long time to get rehired, to get hired by a new company. And her response was, well, Boyd, you know what your personal legend is. And I was on the phone when she said, and I said, you son of a gun. You know exactly what to say. And you know how hard you just made my life for myself to have to balance these. And so I, my first purse was $1,500 I donated. And through donations and donations, and Jane J would match each donation two to one, us hosting galas, which Kristen carried most of the weight, putting a tremendous amount of the weight, putting them together. We'd have three of them now fighting for the Cure Galas, being covered on HBO and, and Real Sports and ESPN and Sports Illustrated and Huffington Post and Time and the Wall Street Journal, and just keep going. We're up over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars now in five and a half years, which began with my vision, Kristen inspiring my vision. It first starting with Kristen, but now one third of the people in our country paralyzed, and there are 300,000 of them with spinal cord injuries, are treated at the VA. Mm. 7,000 people came home, wounded warriors from 01 to 2011, because they were paralyzed. So this is much greater than Kristen now. She, she was the catalyst, but this is service to humanity. Mm. And I stated this on in an interview I gave before. My class motto at West Point, we all pick a class motto and it rhymes with our class year. I'm West Point 2003, protectors of the free. Protectors of the free just doesn't mean protecting those who are free and people are through hostility or trying to take their freedom from them. Protectors of the free means you protect them from what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. So the same mistakes don't repeat themselves. And what they're dealing with now, you give them hope for a brighter tomorrow. So that's what Team Fight to Walk is, and we've raised this much, and it all goes towards Dr. Weizhang's clinical trial. Dr. Weizhang had his meeting with the FDA after submitting his application. It's as if it's a doc dissertation thesis committee. Mm -hmm. thesis committee. They told him what changes they want to see him make. He said he should have them made by 2000, I'm sorry, by June. And he said that they have up to three months by law after they, he resubmits to give him a yes or no. He said if all the changes are made, they give a yes. So before this year is out, well, we should have our yes to begin this clinical trial and we'll start treating how many patients we have enough money for. I do believe after we get the FDA approval and there's something tangible right there, it will be a lot easier to raise the money for it. That's so that's amazing. what Team Fight to Walk is. Yes, ma'am. So if someone wanted to donate to Team Fight to Walk, what would they need to do? Go to Team Fight 
to walk.com. Each word spelled out, fight, and then the T-O, two is T-O, walk.com. And there's a donate button, even if you give a dollar. So we need about 1.2 million more dollars, maybe 1.2 to 1.4 to treat all 12 patients. If 1.2 million people gave a dollar, or 1.4, one dollar, we fund this. It's, it's like, it sounds easy. And I know more than 1.4 million people have heard this message, but they're just not giving it. And I think they keep thinking, oh, what's just my dollar? Well, you know that whole built multi- billion dollar plus jackpot for the lottery that just happened? That was because enough people bought a dollar lottery ticket and the numbers get, so it does a mess. And my message is going to be a lot more stern once we get FDA approval. I may start threatening people, <laughs> let them know that it's actually there. You got to give this. It's right there. And minorities at a higher rate than Caucasians and males more than females are suffering from spinal cord injuries, usually related to gang violence, motorcycles, and bullets, leading causes, cause, and, then di- and then diving, leading causes of spinal cord paralysis. Mm. It stinks. It stinks real bad. And it's the number one taxing sickness, injury, illness, whatever term you want to use that it falls under, on our government because we can live so long now with spinal cord injuries and almost all patients are covered through Medicare for it. It's killing. There's so much incentive financially to cure. There's more incentive than there is to keep it going for those pharma companies that are profiting off this because they may have a drug that you have to take every day because you have paralysis and they don't want to go out of business. There's more grand scheme incentive for our economy. So that's what Team Fight the Walk is and I'm leading this charge. There is talk now of a reality show. There's been talk a little bit, a reality show on my story, my life, and with the finale leading up to a big fight, live TV. My boxing promoter, Lou DiBella, is also has his own, co-produ- has his own production team, company. He co-produced Southpaw and Lucky Six. And then my good buddy, Darren Reed, is the creator of the show Bar Rescue. Are you familiar with that show? Have you ever heard of it? Bar Rescue? I it's have a, not. Loud, loud, big mouth, big Manly man, Italian dude, walks in, goes into a bar, and he gives them the business, chewing them out for what they can do to make their bar successful. Mm-hmm. And they get a few million viewers a week. Oh, and, okay. And then Darren also, last year, had his first big ho- uh, Hollywood movie. It was starring, it was called Lila and Eve, starring J-Lo and Viola Davis. Okay. So he yes, said... Yes, I saw that movie. You did see it? I did, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my About God. the mothers and, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's exactly what... It was what a good it. movie. And he said by mid-February, he should have the teaser put together and start shopping it out to production companies. What this will do to give... Lou DiBella said his mind's eye is a 13-episode reality show over the course of four months. It will cover... God willing, the Army Reserve allows me to bring the cameras there. I go up to West Point, and I spar with the boxing team up there. And sometimes I go and help the coach on some of his meets. So I'm sure America would love to see our nation's young future officers in that respect it covered me teaching my fitness classes stuff with team fight to walk going around to schools and speaking doing uh, additionally doing my paid professional speaking gigs i volunteer at a place named push to walk at times that's a spinal cord injury rehab more important it's a walking rehab so you could have a stroke traumatic brain i hold the boxing pads and i put the gloves on them whatever movement they have let them feel and i and if they don't you bring their hands I watched a video of you doing that with one of the patients, and my father just recently had a stroke in uh, last winter. Show it to him? Yeah, no, I didn't show it to him, but because I'm a boxing enthusiast, that's exactly what I did when he woke up, and I was like, okay, Dad, you know, jab, and, and oh, he, was, he, he, yeah, he was really I doing it. it. Yeah, so I saw your video, and I was like, oh my gosh, he does the same thing, but it is really great therapy, though, is my point. Do you so. tag pops if he doesn't bring his hands back? No, I don't tag him. <laughs> oh, that's the incentive. That makes them learn. <laughs> and it makes them smile because you're treating them as if they're not injured. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. it's amazing. It really made him happy. And I think it's a great, you know, therapy for people, um, especially, you know, stroke victims or anyone just trying to get their mobility back and their, their coordination. So definitely a good exercise I love that you're doing that and I hope your father appreciates as much as you appreciate doing it with him what I used to see what was amazing I would when I would hold the pads for Kristen sometimes when I would throw at her and make her slip I would see her make a movement to get out of the way of a punch that if she if I wasn't doing anything and I asked her to do it she just could she couldn't do it on her own it was as if it ignited a voluntary reflex arc 
or created the, the pathway for it to go that what was there or recruited something for that moment. I went to Burke Rehabilitation, not Burke, I'm sorry, Kessler Rehabilitation Center, which is where Eric Legrand, the Rutgers football player, who broke his neck a few okay. years back. Okay. He's one of my, my good buddies. He does his rehab. I went there years back with Kristen, volunteered my time for free to do this with their people who were injured, and I got looks from their physical therapies as if the third eyeball was here. And it's because I don't have a degree, I didn't have a name or anything. Who am I? I'm sure if and Oscar De La Hoya came in and wanted to offer it, and I felt most sad for the people there who didn't get to enjoy it because at this other place I go, his mother told me, the video you saw on YouTube, his mother said, boy, the next day she said, he said that's the first time he felt like himself in the last 18 years since he's been injured. Mm -hmm. And he smiled. Mm -hmm. And I just made my life. Yeah. So yeah. that's what, and then here's a big, we're, we're planning on running for office in 2018, Democratic Party. God willing, uh, a, a, con a Congress seat, congressional seat. Okay. House representatives. So I've started to have certain meetings, introducing myself to. I had a meeting with, you know, Senator Cory Booker. Yes. His deputy chief of staff. I had a meeting last month and I had a meeting with a councilman up in White Plains and start getting my feet in. So if this reality show happens to give me a, a weekly box <laughs> to tell people about this clinical trial and, and plead with them to give a dollar, making my name, speaking my views on this world and my mind and especially this whole race thing, growing up as light as I am, and I'm a quarter African American, I did my Ancestry.com. <laughs> so I did, I had to know exactly what the percentages were. So my, my heritage back, it's the northern, the French speaking countries in Africa, where the Africans were taken by France and enslaved and brought over to the Louisiana area, Mississippi, Alabama. That's where all my roots, my DNA comes from. So Mali, Togo and Benign, Senegal, Cameroon. And being able to share, I, I get the best benefit. I, I, I believe I have the best benefit. I understand what it's like and the pride I get to carry representing so many different gene pools. And it's a beautiful thing. And I remember, I told my mother, I said, they should make a movie one day where for 30 years, they only allow families of different races to make babies with mm -hmm. each other and see what kind of world we have 30 years after that. Well, I think it's extremely cool that you've got this opportunity to have the uh, reality TV show. I mean, <laughs> if, if it comes through, I would definitely tune in. You know, I think it would be great to follow you around and see how all of those different worlds, you know, intertwine and correlate with each other. And um, the daily boxing I'd have to fit in because I have a big fight at the end. And so the that training. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You would be so busy. Tell me. Um, so you're a motivational speaker for great black speakers now. Tell me about um, your audience, uh, who you plan to speak with, what kind of topics you discuss, and what the audience can expect from you. So I would say youth at all levels, youth going all throughout college, kindergarten through college, and the idea again, being kind, acceptance, not judging, letting your influence on others be surrounded by love and equality and equity. My mother. She told me a few years, last year, she said, when it comes to children, there's no such thing as race, they're just children. And you start them when they're young and have them learning, that's the only way you're gonna change anything, I believe. Mm -hmm. I go and I speak to, uh, I suppose I speak, I saw I'm Jewish on my mother's side, I speak to Jewish physicians pretty often and they're a Jewish federation group, I just got paid to speak in, I was paid to speak in December. I went and spoke to the topic there was curing spinal cord injuries one punch at a time. Mm -hmm. So the idea of trying to help take reality into your own hands to create the space you wanted to be to help something on a clinical level. And I have a very strong clinical background. I've educated myself pretty significantly so I could speak peer to peer on these on these topics. And it's near and dear to them because a lot of physicians get it. And I, I've had some physicians say, I wish that you were doing this for cancer because they're oncologists. And so that aspect speaking on race relations, big one, speaking on youth motivation, government, speaking on athletics to youth as well as adults, 
the idea of fitness in your life as well as professional sports, whatever you want to ascertain, entrepreneurship. And a lot of these talks, they're pretty, they're kind of, they focus around the same, everything is about holding that space. So that's where it begins and how much do you want to suffer to achieve it? And suffering doesn't mean physical suffering. Suffering means how hard do you want to bite down and earn it? What are you willing to do to earn it? And I guess those are the big topics there. I speak at healthcare professionals as well, just about healthcare overall from my experience in, in five, almost five years in, in medical device sales. And I've educated my, there's not a lot of stuff on my, there's so much more I have to offer than just what's on my resume. You can't put those on a professional resume. It's through conversation. For example, I, I was a guest speaker at a stem cell conference in China in 2009, a world stem cell conference. There were 40 to 50 of the leading PhDs and MDs treating patients or doing research, treating patients with stem cells outside of the U.S. or doing research on stem cells. And I was the guest speaker there begging to bring clinical trials to the United States. So that's not on my resume. And, Incredible. <laughs> I was, I was, I didn't have how I earned that when I took Kristen to China to have a stem cell procedure after our second one, and I was picking the physicians' brains there so much, and they saw how much I had educated myself and taught myself already, and how well I spoke. They said they were having this this conference, a symposium, the next, the International Association of Neural Restoratology. It's called. Hmm. Restoratology is not a real word. It's my fault. It's restorology. When they ask me in China, how to translate what they meant. That's like saying restoratate, it's restorate. I'm responsible for that word being wrong. For now they're up like the 15th one or the eighth one of those. Anyway, I, they said, please come on back. We want you to be a guest speaker. And that's what happens often. It's, it's two of them around and what I'm saying. And that changes everything when people understand, they grasp what it is I have to present into this world. I did forget, I just recently joined a board of directors with my good brother, Mustafa Abdullah, and it is called, the name of the prophet is called Boxer Inc. Mustafa Bo Abdullah. Is he a trainer? Yes, he is. Are yes. you at any? Oh, no, I'm in trainer. Vegas. So how do you call him? Uh, Wait, Mayweather, a, Mayweather Boxing trainer. Club. What's up? Yeah, he's been there before, but yeah. he's new, got the beard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. About like late 20s, early 30s. Are you talking about the same... Oh, uh, no, I think the guy I'm talking about is much older than that. Oh, no, hmm. but I do know who you're talking about. Okay. Because I see him on 24-7. I know who you're talking okay. about. Uh, he's just a boxer, Inc. It's going to schools. Usually it's minority-dominant schools, but it's more focusing on inner city. But in New York City, it seems to be inner city is, um, is hard, composed of minorities. And trying to agree or allow their, their students to have us bring boxing there and not for sparring, but as a discipline to teach them how to box and give them some type of format to their life and understanding, training, and discipline and the rules and our, and our laws. If you sign up and you get caught fighting ever, you're out of the program. And I just recently joined on. He has his in two schools already, and then he found a local police athletic league to allow high school students from one specific school to go there and train. We have a, a big fundraiser being put on by this club named Spin. March 11th, they have ping pong tables inside and they have celebrities come and play ping pong all the time. Drake has gone there to play before. Actually, I think I have, I'm destined to meet Drake eventually. There aren't too many black, white, and Jewish folk in this world and, and he and I are, so I just think it's going to be happening. I defend him whenever anybody says me this. Talk about my Drake. So they put on, they're doing a big fundraiser there and I'm going to be one of the people playing ping pong, like a celebrity type thing against the New York State welterweight champion. And then they're going to put a boxing ring inside the club, even with, because the roof ceiling is low, and any person who wants to make a donation can come in and spar with me or another pro, and we'll go as light as possible, because we do this all the time with people who just want to practice, and they go as hard as they want, mm -hmm. they and they have to make a donation. It's going to be $10 per person to come in. This is Spin, New York City. It's on 23rd Street in Madison Park. They can fit up to 700 people in there, so that's $7,000 just for coming in. They're going to allow us to put a silent auction in there. I just... I uh, saw Rosie Perez at the Barclay Center the other day. She said she'll come. I'm going to try to get some of my world, my world champion buddies in New York to come. And they're going to have to do a 24-7 thing, like talking crap to our, our ping pong opponent, me and this other kid building up to it. And they're going to have professional dancers come out. They want us to go into the ping pong table with our boxing robes on and introduce it on the mic. And it's all, and so half of that's going to go to Team Fight to Walk and half's going to go to Boxer Inc. And the focus of of spin is to give towards children suffering or challenged with anything. So I let them know there are many children who are paralyzed. 
And now with Box to Rink, this is for children, exactly, inner city and schools to gain some, some discipline in their lives. What a great event. So tell us, um, give me the website again. Do you have any social media where people can reach out to you directly if they want to um, yes, you know, have conversations about these things? Tell me what those, those um, mediums are. It's Boyd Melson, M as in Mary, Melson. And Boyd is my first name, not my last name. So Boyd Melson, I'm the only Boyd Melson on fa- in this world. So I'm the only one on Facebook. And there's a fan page on there. I didn't create that. I don't know how that got on there, but you can you can like that one. But send me an invite on Instagram. It's Boyd Melson, and on Twitter, it's Boyd Melson. I just started the Snapchat, but I haven't actually used it yet. I got to need someone who's a little younger to school me up on it. <laughs> and if anybody who's watching this right now seriously wants to contact me in regard to anything to do with paralysis or they have somebody they love or know or care about or they know who loves or cares about somebody else who's paralyzed, uh, email me, bamstrong1981 at gmail. B-A-M, my initials, bamstrong1981 at gmail. Email me. I will respond to you. Just don't take advantage of me giving this out and email me for anything silly, please. If it's about paralysis, please email me. I'm always open to help when it comes to that. Okay. All right. So I'm and sure. com. You had asked me the website again. Teamfighttowalk.com. So I'm sure you'll have an increase in followership and, uh, you know, quite a few people reaching out to you for all the things that you do. Great success. Um, you know, definitely kudos to you and your philanthropy, your boxing, which, you know, I love. Um, I love it. You love it. <laughs> and, and thank you for your service. So it has been a pleasure. Same. And I'm sure that, um, you know, you're going to be a great value add to great black speakers. And we hope to get you out in the world spreading this message. I can't wait. And thank you for this honor of filming me here with this, for accepting me into the bureau. I get to be part of something that Stephen A. Smith and Common are part of. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, and I. I'm going to shine so bright for y'all whenever I get out there to talk. Just you watch. Awesome. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.